Today we're going to be talking about development environments and development tools, especially for our front-end applications and how these things all work together. Uh, if you've ever used something like Vite, you know it does quite a bit for you under the hood and you might be wondering how all these tools work together. And that's what I'm going to explain today using this uh, fairly complex diagram. Uh, it turns out the reality is actually a lot more complicated, but this is going to give you a good overview of the different moving parts, at least, and what they all do. And that's going to help you both understand your stack better, and it's also going to let you debug more effectively, since you'll know exactly what part of the stack is introducing your problem, and that will give you a good start to at least Googling how to figure out what's wrong. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and just do a quick chat about how all this stuff works together. I'm using this new app I found called Eraser. It is actually pretty nice. Uh, my favorite feature is it has both the notes over here and it has the diagram over here. And you can go ahead and toggle those. Uh, I found this to be a really useful way to explain things. So let me know if you like these sorts of explanations. So I said I'm going to talk about Vite. If you haven't heard of Vite, come on, what are you doing? This is the best way to build your applications nowadays. You should definitely uh, be using it if you're not. Uh, but if you go ahead and scaffold a new template, you're going to get two commands. You get npm run dev, and this is for your development environment. And if you get npm run build, and that's going to be for your production environment. Uh, and this is mostly going to be shared code, but there's going to be a few subtle differences, and we're going to talk about those as well. And basically the reason you need to use these tools is you want JavaScript that runs in a browser. And it turns out writing this by hand is pretty impractical and uh, not a very good developer experience. We want a good developer experience with things like hot module reload and source maps, should be fast. We also want what I'm calling a good production experience. This means a small bundle, removing unused code, uh, type checking to give you confidence, all that sort of thing. So to give you a small example, let's say we have this application with foo.tsx uh, turning into main, turning into index.html. I have an example over here I'm just going to show you. Uh, let's go ahead and head back. And you can see we have some pretty standard React code here, but quite a few things about this are not going to work in your browser. You obviously type definitions need to be removed, the JSX needs to be compiled, and it turns out these sorts of imports are not going to work either. If we're using ESM in a browser, you need to have a relative import and it must have a file extension. And this is what is going to be handled as part of our compilation step using Vite. So let's go ahead and get started from the very start in foo.tsx. So the first thing we're going to need to do is remove all of the type definitions and get that to be something like a JSX file. Uh, it's going to be different depending on production or development. So in development, we don't really care too much about having type checking, it just slows you down. Uh, so we're going to use a tool called ESBuild to strip out all of those types in development. Uh, if you haven't heard of ESBuild, this is an extremely fast bundler. Uh, there's actually two different bundlers used in Vite, ESBuilder and Rollup. We'll talk about that one in a moment. Uh, but the reason they use ESBuild here is just because it's a really, really fast way to get your code from being TSX into JavaScript. Uh, in production, this is going to be a bit different. You want to have type checking, so they're going to use TSC, which is the TypeScript compiler. Uh, let's go ahead and do a quick compilation just to give you an idea of what this code is actually going to turn into and some of the problems. So back in the day, uh, TypeScript did not handle JSX. I'm going to show you how that looks now, and that's going to give you a better understanding of the different parts of the stack as well. So let's go ahead now and compile this one and see what we get. I'm just going to remove my old artifacts just to make it a little bit more clear what's going on since I think I've duplicated them. I'm going to run this one more time, and we're going to get two files output over here, JSX uh, and files, index.jsx and bar.jsx. So you can see these are fairly similar to the other file that we have originally. Let's just go ahead and take a look at them side by side. All that's changed here is we've removed the type definition. Uh, everything else is exactly the same. Uh, so what's happening here is we're just removing the types, which is the original goal of TypeScript. Uh, since then, it's grown in scope a little bit. It does a few more extra transformations as well, such as getting rid of the JSX. Originally, you couldn't do this, but now you can. Uh, TypeScript has come a long way. I can go ahead and say React JSX going to go ahead and just recompile this one more time just to give you an idea of what the difference is. Let's go ahead and remove the old code and recompile this one one more time. And we're now getting JS files and this is going to give us react.create element which is much closer to being valid JavaScript than the JSX we have over here. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is not working previously but now working in TypeScript is just to give you an idea of the next step here. Once we go from TSX to JSX we then need to go from JSX to JavaScript. Uh, right now we can do this fairly easily with TypeScript or some other plugin. Uh, in, or historically, uh, we would use ESBuild in development here and we're using TSC in production. Uh, previously, before we had things like ESBuild and TypeScript uh, compiler, we would use something called Babel, uh, which would then do take the JavaScript uh, or JSX and turn it into JavaScript. It also applied a bunch of other transformations as well. And this is still something you're probably going to want to do as part of your build pipeline. 
So we've got rid of the JSX, we've got rid of the types, uh, but if you're using something like Vue or Svelte, you may need to use a different compiler. Uh, you may still want to use Babel for polyfills, for example, if you want your code to run in IE10 or something like that. Uh, if you have additional syntaxes like MDX or some other kind of extension, uh, in addition, you're going to have additional transformations like uh, injecting your environment variables, that sort of thing as well. Either way, we've gone through a few different steps from TSX to JSX to JS, and now we have some pretty regular vanilla JavaScript, which is what you can see right here. This is almost valid, but not quite. Uh, notoriously, the JavaScript module system is pretty complex. This kind of code does work in Node.js because it knows to look in Node modules, but this is not going to work in a browser where you need to do relative imports with a correctly uh, qualified import. There's also the problem of having different module systems and all that sort of thing. And this is what Vite is going to handle in both development and production for you. It's going to resolve all those modules, rewrite all the parts and get everything working for you. Uh, Vite is really good at this actually. It handles pretty much everything impressively. Uh, previously, before we had Vite, we would use Webpack for this, which also did the same thing, uh, figured out all the different module systems. Either way, at this point, we have a pretty good bundle that does function in a browser. And depending on development or production, we're going to do something a little bit different. So if we're in production, we can make some optimizations. What we're going to do is go ahead and bundle this. Uh, so we have another bundler here called Rollup, and that's this one over here. Here it is, the JavaScript module bundler. Confusingly, this is also a bundler. You might wonder why there's two different bundlers, and it turns out um, Rollup is just more mature and has a much larger ecosystem, which is why Vite is using that one for bundling here. It's using ESBuild for just the transpilation, so taking JavaScript or TypeScript and turning it into JavaScript, as opposed to doing the bundling. So we're using Rollup to bundle, and at this point, we're also going to do a few additional features for production. We're going to either minify or uglify, which is where you remove all the white space. Uh, you might transform the variables to have smaller names. Uh, you can also do things like change the different uh, chunk sizes, so the different uh, bundles that are emitted. You might want to have multiple entry points. All that kind of thing is going to happen here uh, for your production build. Uh, in addition to that, we're going to have something a little bit different for development. So we're not going to do as much optimization for development, it's just not necessary. What we are going to do is improve our developer experience. And this happens in a few different ways, primarily by doing hot module reload or HMR. And we're also going to apply source maps. So hot module reload, uh, one of the most famous features of originally Webpack is where if you save your file, it's going to automatically update the interface without refreshing the whole page. And it's going to maintain your state. Uh, to make this work, it's going to actually depend on your framework like React and Vue. Uh, they will usually have their own plugins, and this needs to inject some JavaScript uh, just to be able to apply this HMR to your module. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about HMR, I will talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, probably in a different video. It's a complex topic, uh, but needless to say, it is very cool and very useful. We're also going to inject our source maps, and what this is going to do is point uh, if there's an error from our uh, heavily compiled code back to our original code, so we can have an idea of where the error occurred. If we didn't have source maps, we'd get an error message in our compiled code, which can be very hard to read. And that's why we're going to inject our source maps. Finally, if a file does change, so maybe we go ahead and say save on foo, we need to go ahead and repeat this whole process again. So we're going to go ahead, compile it, strip out the types, do the module resolution, and then repeat the process over and over again. Uh, so that is generally how these things work. You can see there's quite a few different transpilers or compilers, uh, and it can be a little bit difficult to understand, but once you get, uh, you get used to working with these tools, it does become a lot uh, more easy to both debug and to develop with. Uh, if this kind of diagram uh, does seem intimidating, but something you'd like to learn more about, or if you just enjoy learning how complex tools work under the hood, I am writing a book about this. I'm going to leave a link to that in the description. You can go ahead and sign up for updates. We're basically going to build a number of these tools from scratch, uh, maybe a little framework for the web, a bundler, uh, maybe it's hot module reload, that sort of thing. Uh, and by building these and implementing them from scratch, you'll learn a lot, a lot about how they work. And these things won't seem so magic after all. Either way, that's all I've got for you today, and I will see you in the next video.